Hi everybody. Thank you friends for being here. I hope this video podcast finds you well, healthy, and secure. Uh, we are going to continue with the treatment of illness go show, which so far has been quite intriguing. Um, several of you have emailed me in recent months, recent weeks about this kind of issue. A lot of people come to Buddhism uh, looking not only to uh, uh, ameliorate their their thinking, their mind, um, but to somehow uh, affect, positively, positively change uh, health conditions, both for themselves and others. Um, there's so many different pollinations uh, on this study and this uh, use of Buddhism. Um, I've talked about it before and uh, uh, there are excellent uh, comments. A lot of them are emails. I struggle sometimes wondering if I should post the emails that I receive somewhere online if not in the comments of the videos because um, I feel like a lot of people are deprived of that information because they don't their private communications uh, and that side of it is that it is a private communication so um, I guess what I want to do is encourage you if you are having issues about health and how to use Buddhism um, what can it do what can it what it cannot do um, how it does or doesn't work um, please don't wait to see it come up in the comments because oftentimes it's a personal issue so email me right tlksylvain at gmail.com all right now we're going to continue with this go show uh and nitrin adopts here his question and answer form of teaching um so this will be we know from this form uh, kind of a deep dive. So let's just get into it. Question. If, as you've stated, the benevolent deities inflict punishment on this country because it does harm to the votary of the Lotus Sutra, then epidemics should attack only the slanderers. Why is it that your own disciples also fall ill and die? So Nietzsche actually talked about this earlier, saying that as you practice to awaken your Buddha, you're going to rattle um, the samsaric karma that is your instantiation. So um, you're likely to bring up uh, things that need to be expiated out of your karmic momentum so that you can alter course. That's just the way samsaric energies manifest. They have a lot of momentum. You have an inertia in your life taking you from birth to death. And that inertia, it repeats and re-manifests those energies all the time. And with our practice of Buddhism, we can trap those energies and slowly modify them, sometimes all at once, sometimes nudges, right? and our life starts to move in a different direction. We have all kinds of words to describe this, but until you uh, begin to really take, take control and demand your Buddha mind to be, become more present in your life, more influential in your life, more manifested in your life, um, you're not gonna know what that feels like, what it looks like. Uh, I can tell you from my own karma busting, if you want to call it that, over over 40 years of practice, is that there are times when I have to look back, and at the end of the year is a good time to do this. Everybody does this every year, right? Um, but sometimes it's not until I take a good look back and think how much my life has changed. Because when you're in the midst of change, sometimes you don't see it. Sometimes you do and you go, wow, that's no longer happening. That, that can only be because I'm habitually enlightening myself a little bit more every day. 
But other times you have to look back and go, wow, there's entire groups of people that I just took for granted existed in my life and they're simply no longer there. It's not like they evaporated from the planet. They just evaporated from around me. Those influences are no longer there. That is a deep karmic shift. Wouldn't you agree? If your life changes course, then the scenery on the periphery of your life changes. This is Buddhist practice. Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. So, this is a question that Nichiren anticipates would logically come up amongst people. You said that uh, uh, your own uh, followers and students will probably get more of the sickness and the epidemics than the others. But he also said that even though the percentage may be higher amongst my students because they're, custo they're, they're, they're attacking this influence, this karma, they're more likely to run into it because of their awakening cause. They also will heal and overcome the illness far more easily and more statistically than the rest of the population. See, that's it's convenient to forget that. So, he's going to respond. Answer, your question is reasonable. I anticipated it. <laughs> Nevertheless, you are aware of only one side of the situation. I think I gave it away. And not the other. Good and evil, lower world tendencies, have been inherited in life since time without beginning. Remember the instantiation of karma, the momentum. According to the provisional teachings and the schools based on them, both good and evil remain in one's life throughout all stages of the bodhisattva practice up to the stage of near perfect enlightenment. Hence, people at the stage of near perfect enlightenment or below have faults of some kind, right? We're all human, but not those at the highest stage. Once you awaken your, your Buddha so consistently, every day assiduously demanding your Buddha mind take over your perception, your human mind, your human perception. And so you shift more and more toward clarity and Buddha way than as a Bodhisattva at that stage, all the karma that has been in your way, so to speak, or creating momentum that is not fully life affirming that's been expiated, your life becomes quite clear. You instantiate your Buddha 24 seven, instead of just moments in front of mandala at your altar or moments when you're in crisis or in turmoil and you're really, boy, your resolve really becomes strong then only to whittle away back toward your samsaric tendencies, right? It's all about tendencies and conditions. Your samsaric life is. But the more we practice, the more we, we nudge that path, right? Toward Buddha-ness and our Bodhisattva existence here as human manifestations. In contrast, the heart of the Lotus School is the doctrine of the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment of life, which reveals that both good and evil are inherent even in those at the highest stage of perfect enlightenment. Remember the ten worlds and the inter uh, possession of the ten worlds, right? The fundamental nature of enlightenment manifests itself as Brahma and Chakra, whereas the fundamental darkness manifests itself as the devil king of the sixth heaven, right? Darakutenamal, right? Who's also on this mandala. Because in hell, there is Buddhahood, there is Bodhisattva, there is learning and realization. They're all intertwined. 
So there's some decision making going on there. You could look at it that way. And the kinetics of all of those karmic influences, like little voices pulling us one way or another, right? You've heard them. The benevolent deities hate evil, uh, do, evil doers, and evil demons hate good people. They're just diametrically opposed forces. Because we have entered the latter day of the law, it is natural that evil demons should be everywhere in the country, just like uh, tiles and stones, trees and grasses. Good demons are few because sages and worthies are rare in this world. One would therefore expect to find more victims of the epidemic among Nietzsche's followers than among the believers of Nembutsu or monks of the true word Zen precept schools. For some reason, however, there is less affliction and death among Nietzsche's followers. That's the point I was making earlier. It is indeed mysterious, isn't it? Is this because we are few in number or because our resolute mind is strong? So again, the equation is, how dedicated are you to awaken your Buddha mind? You may raise more obstacles in your life because you need to expose them to sidestep them, to quell them, to get rid of them. But in that act, you become much stronger and therefore e more easily defeat these negative influences. Whereas others, they don't e they're not even aware. They're just simply blissfully going along with the negative influences like that's the way life is. They don't even know to challenge them. So yeah, they appear to not be sick, but that's not actually what's happened, karmically speaking, right? Question, has there ever in the past been such a terrible outbreak of epidemics in Japan? Is this the first time? Answer, during the reign of Emperor Sujin, the 10th ruler after Emperor Jimu, epidemics swept Japan claiming the lives of more than half the populace. Remember, we've seen this in the West, too, with the uh, uh, plagues, right? But when Emperor Sujin had the people in each province worship the sun goddess and other deities, the epidemic ceased completely. So they took resolve and determined their lives were bigger than them as individuals, Although it wasn't Lotus Sutra Buddhism, it was nevertheless a positive influence, right? Hence the name Sujin, which literally means worshipping the deities. That was before Buddhism had been introduced to the country. The 13th, 31st, and 32nd rulers in the imperial line, along with many of their ministers, died of smallpox and other epidemic diseases. Meditations, prayers were once again offered to the same deities, but this time to no avail. Why didn't it work that time? Because Buddhism had been introduced and those medicines were no longer effective. Time, people, a change in mental acuity. During the reign of the 13th ruler, Emperor Kimei, Buddhist sutras, treatises, and monks were sent from the state of Pakchi to Japan, from Korea to Japan. That was the path of migration of Buddhism, remember. As well as a gilded bronze statue of Shakyamuni Buddha, the Lord of Teachings. The great minister, Solga, urged that the statue be worshipped or paid respect to, paid homage to. But the chief minister, Mononobe, and other ministers, along with the common people, joined in opposing the, the uh, uh, homage of the Buddha, asking or saying that if honor were paid to him, it would enrage the native de deities who then would bring ruin upon Japan. So, see, they were stuck in tradition. They wanted to keep the old ways. 
the emperor was still trying to decide which opinion to follow when the three calamities and seven disasters struck the nation on a scale never known before, and great numbers of the populace died of disease. The chief minister Mononobe seized the opportunity to appeal to the emperor. As a result, not only were the Buddhist monks and nuns disgraced, but the gilded bronze statue of Shakyamuni Buddha was placed upon burning coals and destroyed and the Buddhist temple was likewise burned. So, the traditionalist managed to convince the emperor, see, we're having all this disease and all these problems because they brought that infernal statue into our country. In, in a way, blaming Korea for inflicting all of this disease and uproar in their country. At that time, the chief minister contracted a disease and died, and the emperor also passed away. The great minister Solga, who says here worship, but obviously this is a Western word, so we need to understand he paid deep respects to the Buddha, also fell ill. He allowed this to happen. The minister Moriya, the chief minister's son, declared that the three successive emperors as well as his own father had died in the epidemic solely because homage had been paid to the Buddha. Let it be known, he declared, that the prince Shotoku, Soga no Umako, and the others who revere, that's a better word, the Buddha, are all enemies of my father and of the deceased emperors. Hearing this, the imperial princes Anabe and Yakabe, along with their ministers and thousands of retainers, all joined forces with Moriya. Not only did they burn images of the Buddha and their temples, but a battle broke out and Moriya was killed in the fighting. For a period of 35 years after Buddhism had first been brought to this country, not a year passed without seeing the three calamities and seven disasters, including epidemics. But after Mononobe no Moriya was killed by Soga no Umako and the deities were overpowered by the Buddha, the disasters abruptly ceased. Outbreaks of the three calamities and seven disasters, which you can look up on your own, that occurred thereafter were for the most part due to confusion within Buddhism itself. But these would affect only one or two persons or one or two provinces, one or two clans or one or two areas. Such disasters occurred because of the curse of the deities, because Buddhism was slandered or because of the people's distress. The three calamities and seven disasters of these past 30 years or more, however, are due solely to the fact that the entire country of Japan hates me, Nichiren, in province after province, district after district, and village after village, everyone from the ruler on down to the common people seethes in anger against me, such as the world has never seen. This is the first time that the fundamental darkness has erupted in the lives of ordinary people caught in the illusions of thought and desire. Even if they pay homage to the deities, the Buddha, or the Lotus Sutra, these calamities will only be aggravated, but it is different when the votary of the Lotus Sutra offers meditations to the essential teaching of the Lotus Sutra. In the final analysis, unless we succeed in demonstrating that this teaching is supreme, these disasters will continue unabated. So there's a battle going on here for the actual this is the time and the place and the people's capacity now in the latter day. And nothing should stand in the way of the supreme ultimate practice that Shakyamuni taught as his own enlightenment. This is the time. Anything else is derision. It's, it's an insult to you know the way to go. For you to deviate from the way to go or, or ignore it or battle against it is the ultimate self-destruction. So don't be surprised. This is what Nichiren is saying. This is the time for Myoho Rengekyo. This is the way to awaken. 
There are no, it says in the lower, there are no two ways, Shariputra, or three ways. There is only this one vehicle, Myoho Rengekyo. This is the way. This is the Buddha way. And as a samsaric being, it is the Bodhisattva way. There are no other ways. So with that declaration, and this being the time, all of your energies must be focused on this one vehicle, this one way. This is why we don't have anything else around our altar that might distract our attention. No football trophy, no picture of Farrah Fawcett. Some of you older folks will know what I'm talking about. No, you know, proud models, balsa wood models of airplanes that you've built. Nothing. Put those on other walls in your room. But the wall with the altar is all about this mandala and your gohanzam. Nothing else should detract or dis dissuade you from that focus. That is the resolve required to instantiate, to manifest your Buddha mind. Right? Not a new car, not a better relationship. All of those earthly desires, they're fine if they get you in front of the altar. But the moment you're in front of the altar, you're not chanting for a Camaro. That's ridiculous. When would the Buddha have ever said, if you want some material goods in your life, you just go rub the magic lamp and chant it into existence? That's nuts. There are cults out there that have done this to Buddhism, and they are heinous enemies of Shakyamuni Buddha and Nietzsche and Tendai and every other Bodhisattva and scholar who's tried to pass on this teaching. The only wish granted through practice of Namo Myoho Rengekyo is your Buddha-ness, your Buddha mind. If that's not enough of a gift for you, then I don't know what to tell you. All goodness in this samsaric life derives from the clarity of Buddha. Worldly stuff, it doesn't matter. What matters is your life condition. If your life condition is supported by 180 foot yachts, then they'll just show up. You don't need to chant for them. Chant for your Buddha-ness. As Buddha, you don't get sick. You conquer sickness. As Buddha, there is no illness. You conquer illness. There is only one goal in Daimoku, and that is, wake up. Where's my Buddha? Let me see through my Buddha. Let me live through Buddha. That's it. If that's too simple, <laughs> again, it's karma. <laughs> the great teacher Tendai, in his great concentration and insight, described the ten objects of meditation and ten meditations, but no one after him practiced them. In the days of Miao Lo and Dengyo, some people practiced them to an extent, but en encountered few difficulties because there were no powerful opponents. That's that samsaric problem. The three obstacles and four devils described in the Great Concentration and Insight will not arise to obstruct those who practice the provisional sutras because they're provisional. They're just you learning. They don't pose a threat to samsaric problems, right? But now each and every one has risen to confront me. They are even more powerful than the three obstacles and four devils that the ten, that Tendai, Dengyo, and others had to face. There are two ways of perceiving the 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. One is theoretical and the other is actual. 
What Tendai and Dengyo practiced was theoretical, but what I practice now is actual. Because what I practice is superior, the difficulties attending it are much greater. The doctrine of Tendai and Dengyo was the 3,000 realms in a single moment of life of the theoretical teaching, while mine is that of the essential teaching. These two are as different as heaven is from earth. You should grasp this deeply when the time comes to face death. With my deep respect, Nichiren. Well, that is an exegesis for us to study the 3,000 realms. Now, if you use the playlist link on the home page of this channel, you'll see that I've done an entire series, quite a few videos, on the origins of life, um, the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment. Uh, there are other uh, videos on this channel that cover that. So you could use the search and just type in 3,000 realms and see what comes up, because I mention it a lot. But uh, the playlist, at least, of the, that set of videos is a deep dive, a dissection, and it's probably about six years old, so it probably could use some updating and some revisions. Uh, once I finish this book, which there's only um, two, three, or four short uh, letters left in it, um, I think I'll be jumping around uh, talking about Nargarjuna. There's a lot of interest about the perfect perfection of wisdom sutras. Um, but I may also go back through and look at the basics and do a whole series again, just covering short videos, if possible for me, <laughs> of the various things like the Four Truths and uh, Daimoku and Gangyo and all of that. Um, for those of you who are newer or need a, re a reminder of what these basics of practice are. And I'm, I'm open to suggestions, so use the comments. Let me know where you think your practice needs uh, some insight, where you would appreciate some, uh, maybe some parts of the practice are very clear to you, and maybe some don't seem so clear, or maybe they're actually confusing you. I want to know that because I want to demystify the stuff everywhere I can because it's a very, very straightforward practice, though because it involves life-changing moments in front of this mandala and your daimoku. Um, this by no means, as simple as it is, it's by no means easy. It takes uh, quite a lot of courage to be able to see your life as it truly is, uh, which is the only way really that you can move beyond it, right? So, Congratulations to you for doing this in the first place. Um, and yeah, let me know in the comments how you're doing, uh, what it is that you find trips you up. I'd like to do more videos on those kinds of things because I think all of us experience those moments when we go, what the heck is going on with this part of my life that I can't seem to change, right? Um, and uh, the answer usually is you have to look at your daimoku and your practice. But that's, it's helpful to have some human empathy and discussion around these subjects. And not, even if only to learn where to look for extended answers. Because you've got to have your own insights, right? I can't give you your Buddha mind. Only you can. So if through conversation we can unlock the doors that are shut to you, maybe you don't even know there's a door there. Um, only through dialogue can we go, oh, I didn't think to look there, and suddenly you'll have a different impetus to your daimoku, and things will open up, things will change. It's an interesting practice, this Buddhism, isn't it? Namo Myohoden Geikyo Shakyamuni. All right. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the channel. Um, I have a bookstore, I have a Gohanzan store. You can get to all those links through threefoldlotus.com. 
Uh, don't forget, you can download the audio podcast if you'd like to listen to uh, these podcasts that way. Sometimes that's very beneficial. So I will let you go. I'll see you in the next one. Take care of yourself. Take care of your health. Be kind. Bye-bye for now. Hey, thank you for being here. Did you know there's a third way you can help support this channel? And it won't cost you a cent. Yep, if you are not able to be a patron on Patreon or use the uh, PayPal me at uh, dot com at Sifu Sylvain because uh, you don't, don't have the financial fortune to help uh, support this channel right now, you, as I say, always support this channel by watching. But you can also help us grow so that maybe one day we can get over 10,000 subscribers and YouTube will grace us with monetization. It's not a lot, but if you can make sure you're subscribed and share a video like a, a simple one, just go into the search criteria and type monk and you'll have a video that'll come up uh, that's been up for years about what is a monk. You know, it's called a monk, who, how, where, something like that. That might be a great introduction to somebody who doesn't understand what a monk is to begin with. Um, it's a tool. Use this channel as a tool to help you with your bodhisattva practice and share a video to somebody who you think, oh, I know somebody who will benefit from watching this. And in that way, you can help us grow. And that's a really good way to help your practice along as well. So just wanted to drop that in on you in case that's something that uh, you might find useful. Take care of yourself again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.